tell us a little bit about your background. Well, uh, a long, long time ago, while I was in the Air Force, before I got on Air Force One, I used to work for a congressman named Mendel Rivers from uh, Charleston, uh, South Carolina. A very powerful gentleman in the Congress. And he took a liking to me. So uh, I had been around the world with him, and he, he came up to me in the back of the airplane one day, and he said, son, where about you from anyway? I said, well, sir, I'm from Long Island. And he said with some disdain in his voice, Long Island. I said, yes, sir, but I'm from the South Shore of Long Island. And he pounded me on the back and said, that's a good decision. So I grew up in the South Shore of Long Island. It looks a lot like Brunswick County. I mean, it has Barrier Island, it had Fire Island. It's got inlets, waterways, oceans. It looks just like that. And uh, in 1965, I got drafted. I was living in a great town, and it had a lot of money, and the job was good. I was driving a 1960 Chevrolet Impala convertible in 1965. I had a, I, life was wonderful when I got drafted. General Kulak one time, on, um, in the, who was the Commandant of the Marine Corps, said to me, Howie, why did you join the Air Force? I said, well, sir, I said in 1965, well, several of my friends had gotten drafted and went to Vietnam. Several of them got killed. Uh, and I figured out the United States Air Force was the only armed forces in the United States of America that the enlisted person wasn't the primary re resource to get shot. In the Air Force, it was the officer. And that's the guys that fly the airplanes. And he laughed and said, well, I never thought of that. I said, well, I did. So I, I came from a, 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 a very upscale community, and I worked for a, a, a yacht club on the Fire Island for the jet set in the 60s. And I had worked for uh, a French chef, uh, a uh, Hungarian lady that was the former chef of the Fontainebleau in Florida. And she was uh, uh, she was one of those persons that was in the in the camps in, in, in Hungary. She had that tattoo on her arm and uh, the stories that she would tell me. And I, and I worked for um, a uh, French chef an Italian chef, and then a Greek chef, and they told me about the world, and they had been all over the world, so I had this vision of someday traveling around the world. <clears throat> but I had this experience, uh, and I ended up putting in for food service in the Air Force, and I got what I wanted. Uh, I didn't get where I wanted, <laughs> but I ended up going to Rapid City, South Dakota, and then I went to Guam, and I had a lot of experience in food and service and things of that nature. While I was on Guam, the flight crews liked me. I worked in an in-flight kitchen, and uh, the flight crews took a liking to me, and they asked me if I wanted to cross-train to be a, a flight attendant. I didn't even know what that was and didn't know they had that such thing in the Air Force. And, uh, <clears throat> but they liked me, and they said, you know, well, I said, well, what do I have to do? They said, well, you're going to have to extend eight months over your four-year commitment in the Air Force. And I said, oh, you got the wrong person. No, I'm getting out. I'm going home as fast as I can. Didn't like the Air Force, didn't like what I did. Uh, couldn't wait to get home. So they must have wanted me pretty bad because they said, well, let's put you on one flight and see how you like it. So what I did was I went to Okinawa and spent 36 hours and ran into a good friend of mine that was in the Marine Corps over there that I grew up with. And then I went to Taipei, Taiwan for five days uh, with the general and, and uh, 24 full colonel. And uh, it, was a, it was a time of my life. And the, the thing that got me, the crew, of course, they were happy doing what they're doing. People who are like what they're doing are more happier than some other people. And they treated me with respect and appreciation. And I hadn't had that at all since I was in the Air Force. And I liked to travel. So I got to see, I got said, okay, I can see the world, but I can see it a little more faster than being on a ship or something like that. I uh, worked for these generals. They liked me, and they put me in the 89th Military Airlift Wing in uh, 1970. And uh, that's the special missions that flies the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Vice President, uh, congressional groups, things of that nature. And I did that for, uh, for um, about six years. In 1976, I used to fly with Henry Kissinger. And uh, some of the people that may have watched this uh, interview probably know him, know, remember the shuttle diplomacy missions traveling all over the world. Well, I, I was one of the primary people that stayed with Kissinger. Uh, he paid me one of the best compliments I ever got in my life. He said to me, how will you treat me better than an old Jewish mother? And uh, that's a pretty big compliment, actually. And uh, it was a great trainer. 
he was a great trainer. I mean, if you can work for Henry, you can work for anybody. The, the amount of people that worked for him that became very successful, and I would say all because of his uh, training as far as uh, demanding and how to th deal with things. In 1976, I was on a trip in South America with Dr. Kissinger, and a phone call came into the airplane from the chief flight attendant on Air Force One, Charlie Palmer, and he said, when you come back off the trip, we want to talk to you. And I, that was the phone call that everybody was waiting for, and I was so lucky to get the phone call, so I was very appreciative. When I came back, I sat and talked to him, and he said to me, look, he said, we'd like to hire you, but it's six months before the elections, President Ford is president, and the president could lose, and they could change the whole crew. So we, we can't guarantee a job, but if you're willing to take the risk, uh, we, we'd like to have you. So I said, yes, I'm willing to take the risk. And uh, it ended up I'm the only person in the world that ever worked for five presidents consecutively without getting fired. So I took the risk, and it was worthwhile. And that's how I got on Air Force One. And uh, as I said, I worked for President Ford, President Carter, President Reagan, President Bush, President Clinton. He's guilty, but he's a nice guy. So that's a little bit of the background. So what was it like working on Air Force One? Well, it's a, it's a dinner theater for us. I was, a, I was a steward on the airplane and I became the chief flight attendant on the airplane the last two years of the George, George H. Bush administration, the first two years of the Clinton administration. So our job is to find, the mission of Air Force One has got three main functions. Number one, to provide secure and safe air transportation for the president. Number two, to try to provide all the services the White House would be provide for the president only as he travels throughout the world. And my, my job was to provide a professional but comfortable atmosphere. And I was responsible for all the services that took place on Air Force One. And uh, if you had a, a birthday party or you had a celebration and all the meals and the meal requirements and the special needs, and we took care of the crew, we took care of the president, the first, the staff, senior staff, Secret Service, uh, flight crew, uh, the press. So it was a, it was more or less a hotel manager that traveled in a hotel that flew all over the world. Um, you said you worked for five different presidents. So how long overall did you end up working on Air Force One? I was there for 18 years. So that was a, that's a piece of history, and I'm very proud of that. I also was stationed to the military people with Elizabeth. I got. I was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base for 24 years. Uh, I don't think that anybody else was able to do that. Never got out of assignment. I never tried to get out of assignment. In fact, I tried to get an assignment towards the end of my career. Mr. General Schwarzkopf wanted me to go to work for him in Tampa. I thought that was a good idea, but the White House said you're not leaving. So uh, it was okay with me. So what are what is your favorite or some of your favorite memories from working on Air Force? Well. Um, I had, I've had, there's quite a few, uh, one that, you know, I get a chuckle out of, remember, you know, we took care of the presidents and the first families, we put them to bed, we woke them up. One of my, uh, one of my stories that I have in my book, I had an opportunity, I'm, you know, I'm the only one in the world who works for five presidents, I'm probably the only one that in the world that ever did what I'm about to tell you. I'll give you an idea of a president's travel in their days. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, presidents usually work seven days a week, uh, 10 hours a day. They're doing something. And, uh, and I get a little concerned sometimes when they get complaints that they're supposed to be playing golf. Well, if you're a president and you're playing golf, you have a military aide standing next to you with the football. That's the codes to make a, a World War III, so to speak. So he's always doing something. And... Um, President Clinton, we had a summit trip. We were going to Russia for the first time, and it was early in his administration. But his mother had passed away, and uh, he went to Little Rock for on one of our Gulfstream airplanes and to, to go to his mom's funeral. And uh, so anyway, he comes back from his funeral. Everybody knows how tiring a funeral is. Three days in, in, in Little Rock, and he returns to Andrews Air Force Base at 9.30 at night. At 9.30 at night, he walks off this Gulfstream, walks over to the 747. Now, both airplanes, when the president's on board, is Air Force One. Whatever the airplane that the president's on board is Air Force One. Now they have uh, two 747s and a Gulfstream and a, and a uh, <coughs> 
757 is dedicated to him, but it's whatever the president's on, then it's Air Force One. So he walks off one airplane, 930 at night. Now, 938, most people want to take their shoes off and put their feet up. 930 at night, he's walking up the stairs. He's getting ready to go to Moscow to a summit. Uh, Mrs. Clinton is already on the airplane, and her mother accompanied them on this trip. All the staff is there. And Ted Koppel was doing Nightline making of a summit so that means he walks up the stairs and he's uh, introduced to ted koppel and he's on he's on stage again he's working and it and uh it it, it took most of the evening finally the uh, the the nightline show was over and uh, oh, on that time ted koppel i knew ted koppel he introduced me on the airplane with the president i thought that was very nice but anyway uh because i used to fly with him with dr kissinger so anyway, I finally get uh, Mrs. Clinton to bed, and it's very late. And um, 30 minutes later, I got the president. Now, in the in the first part, in the, in the nose of the airplane on the first floor, and there's a private area, private stateroom for the president. And they have two couches and a, and a, and a uh, desk that you both both people could sit at, face each other. But it's a private area, and uh, they the couches pull out. A little bit nicer than your normal couch that pull out at home, and that's where they get to sleep. So I got the beds were already made up, and I got the first lady and, and settled down. Thirty minutes later, I got the president settled settled down, and they stayed up late and they were working. Well, guess what? At three o'clock in the morning, Washington time, which is two and a half hours after the president went to bed. If, I, if you recall, I said he came from a funeral, three days out tiring, 9.30 at night. He's doing nightline. He gets two and a half hours sleep. And I literally should have gave him two hours, but I felt terrible for his, you know, he's probably exhausted. And I gave him an extra half hour. So the situation for me is when I had to get him up at 3 o'clock in the morning, body time, Washington time, and you get your best rest the last three hours of your normal sleep cycle. Anyway. Um, so I eliminated that completely from him. And uh, when I stepped in that stateroom, I had one hour and 30 minutes from the time the front door of that airplane is going to open in Moscow when the president walks out with the world press. I should allow myself more time, but remember, I felt terrible for his lack of sleep. Now, luckily, the president was one year younger than me. Uh, we grew up listening to rock and roll, and uh, he, he liked me. And I, I liked him. We're not talking politics now. Uh, probably liked me because I was one of the few people who didn't ask him for anything. So anyway, now my job is to wake him up. And I go in and I, and I lean on the president. And he kind of moaned a little bit and moved. And I leaned on him again. And I said, honestly, I said, boy, I hate to do this. The president yelled at me and said, well, don't do it. Well, you see, he had a history of people, when people had to wake him up, uh, his staffers and things of that nature, they used to say, let Howie wake him up. He likes Howie. <laughs> because he was a little different. Because he, he always stayed up late. He didn't get a proper amount of sleep. So when he yelled at me, you realize that I had so much time, I got to get him up and get him ready. And that's when I said, sir, it's time to get your butt out of bed and go to work. He was okay with that. That was common language with him, my age group and his age group. Well, at, at that point, Mrs. Clinton uh, is starting to laugh because she heard me tell the president of the United States to get his butt out of bed and go to work. And she starts laughing. I looked at her and said, don't you laugh, you're next. Let's go. So there's not many people who got a chance. And, I, and I, my wife wants me to say, but I probably didn't say, but I probably said the other word. And uh, so that, that's history in itself. But we got them up, and then they have to take a shower. We had they didn't have their coffee, and I got somebody bringing them coffee, and uh, you know I'm in there trying to help them and things of that nature. So that and that was a moment, and I, I'm not political. I saw the uh, the family working together, and I have them under duress. It's three o'clock in the morning with stress that they're going to Moscow. And they were getting along sometimes, I mean, better than my family, and I get ready to go to church on Sunday morning. So I saw, this is what I saw behind the scenes. That was, that was a, a, a memorable occasion to me. Um, I'll give you an idea of, of how close we get with the presidents and how they know what we do and things of that nature. 
when uh, when Hurricane Andrew came through Florida, we had a trip the day the hurricane was coming up towards Florida, um, and I had been watching that. And I said to my wife, we had a trip. We went to New York. The president, we went to Philadelphia, uh, to uh, Newark, New Jersey, with the airplane. The president was uh, <clears throat> George H. Bush was speaking to the to, to the um, <clears throat> the big group. <laughs> I got a senior moment. Um, anyway, he and and well, well. Anyway, I said to my wife, you know, if that 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 hurricane goes across Florida, this is close to the campaign, he's not going to pass up the opportunity to go directly down there and see what's going on. And um, so I had, I went into the office and I said, I need an extra thousand dollars for food just in case. And they kind of chuckled, you don't need that. I said, well, I want to be prepared. Um, I called my advance officer up in Newark. I said, uh, be Look, hunt for me a very good grocery store, and I need transportation. I need to be able to get there and a driver to get us back and forth because I may have to purchase another meal. Because the meal requirements on the airplane, we had a breakfast going up to Newark and then going back to Washington, D.C., uh, <coughs> we had a snack meal, just snacks and things of that nature. So anyway, we're sitting on the ramp up there about 1030 in the morning. And there was, I'll never forget, it was a major in the army named Rusty, who was military A, first day on the job. And uh, he had advanced the mission. Thank you. He advanced the mission. So he had come up a day early, but he was on the Air Force One as a passenger returning to Washington. And uh, so he had access to the airplane. It was 1030 in the morning. We were watching the, the hurricane, and it looked like it was going across Florida. We were watching it on the television on the airplane. So anyway, uh, the major came upstairs, and the crew and the pilot was, sit, was sitting on a couch, and we were standing around, and he said, who's Howie? In front of the group, and I said, oh, I am, sir. What can I do for you? He said, well, the decision was just made that we're going to go to Florida to see the hurricane, what the results are, and the president yelled out, somebody's got to tell Howie. So he said, Major said to me, this is my first day on the job. When the president said, I want to, you know, somebody's got to tell Howie, I want to find out who Howie is because I, I may have to deal with Howie. And that's why he came out. Well, I kept went over to the pilot who was a good friend of mine. And I said, uh, he was a little upset because sometimes pilots have big egos and that's fine with me. I'd rather fly with a person with a big ego than not. Uh, and he was a little upset because they didn't call him, they called Howie. And uh, I went over to him and I said, well, sir, I said, can I go shopping? He said to me, not until I get the official word. And I said, fine. And about three minutes later, he called me back over and he said, uh, Howie, uh, how much time do you need to go shopping? I said, well, sir, I probably needed the last three minutes. He said, get out of here and go to work. But anyway, that was a, that was a, one of those how closely we work and the president understood we're going to now go to Florida. We're going to have a meal on the airplane for these passengers and things of that nature. So uh, that's, that's another little example. So do you have a favorite president to work for or were they all like different in their own way? Well, I didn't have to work for LBJ. Everybody that I was, I'm the only person in the world that worked for five presidents consecutively without getting fired. A friend of mine named Charlie Green, he was a crew member on Air Force One during the Johnson administration. Whatever you heard about President Johnson was true. Uh, he, he, his management style was warlord. That means he, he, he led through fear and intimidation. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that, that does work, but you don't get as much out of your people if you involve them in the process. And Charlie Green was personally fired by President Johnson eight times, but he got hired nine times. So. Uh, that, that I, with the presidents I worked for, they were all gentlemen, and the first ladies were all very delightful. Uh, as for, and remember, I'm not political, but out of all those presidents working for, uh, and I and I was an augmentee on the crew and, and flew missions with President Nixon also, but I wasn't a, a, a permanent crew member at the time. Um, was Ronald Reagan. And I say that because he was the most, that he, him and his administration at that time, as far as I'm concerned, and anybody that's been around there will tell you, the most organized administration ever hit the White House. I got a schedule with Reagan every three months. 
and and that's what you did for that three month period of time, unless something happened national security wise. The other presidents, all of them, regardless of Democrats or Republicans, they were so fluid in changing. Um, sometimes I get a schedule. We started out once a month, and then it would be once a week, and then it'd be twice a week, and literally it was baloney. Uh, I literally had to have a mole in the White House feeding me information, and uh, because. I have to get this airplane ready to go. I have to take care of all these people. So, uh, you know, to have an organization like the Reagans where that's what you did when they said they were going to do it was fantastic. Now, to add to that, if somebody is a crew member out there, <coughs> if they can understand, in eight years, we never took off any earlier than 930. We think that's wonderful. Um, and we probably landed somewhere around 530 in the afternoon. He was at the age you work from nine to five. Unless you, there is a reason, that's the way you should work. Uh, very civilized, as far as I was concerned. Uh, the difference, as an example, when George H. Bush came along, he was a go-getter. We flew more with George H. Bush. I'm not complaining by any means, but we flew more with George H. Bush in the first six months than we flew with Ronald Reagan in eight years. Now, the, the different, he was a go-getter, and he and he kept on moving, and he he he. Uh, when he played golf, he played golf in two hours and 45 minutes. So he's a, he's a go, go, go guy. And uh, we leave at seven o'clock in the morning out of Washington to go to Japan to a summit. And uh, he would, he, we, that means if we left at seven, I'm not complaining, we get up at three, we take off at seven, fly 13 and a half hours to Honolulu, uh, serve three meals and a snack meal, take care of the passengers, refuel the airplane two and a half hours, fly another 13 and a half hours to Sydney, Australia, have a minimum ground stop, and then go to Japan. And, uh, I mean, when we got to Japan, everybody was wiped out, and so was the president. You don't sleep properly on an airplane. That was, uh, that was when, I don't know if some people may recall, uh, he got sick, and uh, he was beat, and uh, he ended up throwing up on the prime minister of Japan at a big dinner. So... Uh, hey, but he was a go, go, go. We used to, our joke was, doesn't this guy know he's got a secretary of state to do that? So, but, but Reagan was, if we went to New York, gentlemen would have Broadway tickets for the crew. I mean, he, he was, he was uh, uh, very personable. What I saw, and I tried to catch him for eight years being a phony. I said, this guy, I don't think he can be this good, but he was. If you got around him within five to eight feet, it was like being plugged into a power cord. It just automatically used energy for some reason. So uh, if I went into the stateroom for Ronald Reagan to do something insignificant, like give him a glass of water, and it, you know, the doctor says drink water all day. Well, he paid attention, and that's what he did. I'd peek into the stateroom, and his water glass would be down. So I'd get a fresh glass of ice water, bring it in. And I wasn't looking for it, I wasn't expecting it, but the reality was every time I did something ins even insignificant for him, he would show some sign of nonverbal or verbal appreciation for me. Now that's a boss. So you you get you go see the boss and the boss makes you feel better. <laughs> Naturally and, and sincerely, that's the key. But I and I try to catch him being a phony. I mean I worked hard at it. I'm fairly, but I just couldn't do it. So I'm going to transition a little bit to your book. So tell us a little bit about your book. Well, how it started about um, my wife and I, my wife, Linda, who you met earlier, set this thing up. She was administrative assistant to uh, President Carter and President Reagan, and uh, she was flew on the airplane. Uh, the 707-27000 uh, that's out in, in California at the Reagan Ranch, uh, we were called here up. We were here in Brunswick County. I was working at the airport and we were requested to accompany the airplane to bring it back to California to give it to Nancy Reagan. And uh, we ended up doing that. And uh, on the, we had a lot of press on the airplane. They interviewed us and NBC had us in their Rolodex that we were a couple that used to fly on Air Force One. So we did an interview on the Today Show in New York and Al Roper was the one that did the interview. And uh, they had a mock-up of Air Force One in the background, and they interviewed my wife and I. At the end of the interview, uh, <coughs> he, um, Al Roker was very gracious. He said, Howie, I'd love to hear the rest of your story. 
Well, within 45 minutes, I got picked up by several speakers bureau and I ended up traveling around speaking for, and it was an APB speakers bureau, which was one of the top, I mean, it was Gorbachev and people like that and me, I thought that was funny. And, and, and it, the one thing that he, they used to say, they thought I was the best, cheapest speaker they had. So anyway, when I'd go give a speech to a whole, a whole group of people, at the end of the speech, people would come up and say, boy, you ought to write a book. Well, initially you think it'd just be a nice to you. And finally my wife said, you got to write a book. So that's, that's where that came about. And we did. And uh, if you can see it, <clears throat> yes, sir, Mr. President. It's got over 300 stories and a lot of humorous stuff and things of that nature. Uh, there were some people that wanted to get involved in writing the book, wanted me to come up with some evil stuff. <laughs> but I, I didn't have much of that, and I wouldn't do it anyway. That's not my goal. Um, I, I, I give you a life behind the scenes or on Air Force One and crew members and passengers. I talk about presidents and first ladies anecdotes and, and numerous uh and i've had i've had so many compliments on it people have really it's a fast read and they really enjoy it so that's how the book came about my wife said you gotta write a book she says to do it you gotta do it that's right i understand um so i think originally you were supposed to do a book signing as like part of our in-person lectures so where can people purchase your book at well, if they go to HowieFranklin.com, you can get it all over the place. But if you go to HowieFranklin.com and you hit PayPal, I will send and, it, and they, I discount the book $5 and I send you an autographed book and I pay for them. So to HowieFranklin.com and you, you'll see all different information about me, but you'll see how to pay for a book and I will send it to you and autograph it to the person. And finally, just tell us a little bit about what you've been up to um, since you were on Air Force One. Well, I got off of the job in, uh, in 1994, and I had I could have stayed another year in the Air Force. And I, I it's going to sound like a bragging. My my position as a chief flight attendant uh, and chief on Air Force One, I was probably one of the more powerful NCOs in the United States Air Force because I had access and people wanted to. That's the reality. And uh, I got offered this wonderful job running the, K the Brunswick County Airport, which is down here by Oak Island and Southport. It was a 4,000 foot runway, uh, and it was fairly busy. I noticed that right away. Well, guess what? We got 60 miles of beach, 39 golf courses, people come to the beach. So even as a little uh, airport, it was very busy. We had more traffic than most airports. And you, you'll find Ocean Isle, when the weather's good, if they had more room, they could fill that at, at airport up so anyway <clears throat> uh that's what we started doing and the thing is that i knew that gave me an advantage when an airplane lands at my airport i know what the passenger wants i know what the crew wants more so than my counterparts because that's what i did for so many years so that gave me a big advantage and what we do is we're in the customer service business everybody that works and we bought into it now i have to do a lot of leading and, and, and managing and educating and they the employees here bought into the fact that we're in customer service business. The fact that we move airplanes and 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 refuel airplanes and do things and those are tasks that we do and most people they like what they're doing, moving airplanes, but the customer service is first. Um, when I started here in 1994 we had a nine a $75,000 budget and uh, we're now over a million and uh, over a million dollar budget. The airports in the black, and most GA general aviation airports are not close to that. Uh, we're very busy. Um, we're the fourth busiest airport in North Carolina, according to FAA, not according to me. Charlotte's number one, Raleigh's number two, Greensboro's number three, and Cape Fear Jet Port's number four. Um, why? We got 60 miles of beach, 39 golf course, best weather on the coast. According to Virginia Tech, uh, they called me up and they were going to run some big aircraft out of here. And I asked them, why did you pick us? And I'm talking to the scientist on the phone from Virginia Tech. He said, well, you got the best weather on the coast from Maine to Key West. Now, think about it. And we're, we're in the summertime. We're cooler than Hilton Head. We're cooler than Charleston. We're cooler than Savannah. We're cooler than Jekyll Island. And sometimes we're even cooler than Hatteras. 
So, and in the wintertime, we're the same temperature. It's the closest thing to this, this Brunswick County area and close to the beach is one of the best weather. It's closest to the closest thing to California climate on the East Coast. So people come here. And that's, so I have a destination airport. Uh, recently, when the pandemic hit in April, we, we cut our, our air traffic down. These are large jets owned by billionaires and billionaire companies. Um, we had about 12 of them for that month, which is still a pretty good number. Well, when the thing opened up, we went. To, we had 75 large jets land here in, in, in May. So they, they, they look at Brunswick County and the area and they feel safer here than most places. And uh, I mean, the CEOs of big corporations and they're coming, where are they coming from? San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Dallas, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Tennessee, New York, New Jersey. They're, they're coming from all over to this location. The lights went off again. Automatic lights, new technology. So uh, the, the airport has is, is been tremendously successful. I have a trem uh, the, the county commissioners seem to support us. They understand. Now, while we built this, this terminal building in the facility, we're now at 5,505 feet. And... Uh, and, and the reason that we got money to be able to do this, the state, North Carolina State University has done economic impact studies on aviation for the last 20 years. The outcome was for every dollar a state put in aviation, they say they got a $19 return. So they didn't, they didn't build this because they like us. They built it because it's a good economy. And my position is they're lying 50%. We're still doing good. <laughs> so that's basically uh where we came from and where we are now and we're still just getting started with, with this economy in this area and we're not branded i mean you know there's many places brand they don't know brunswick county uh, they, you know we're not branded at all but they're coming and they know about it. Well, Howie, thank you so much for meeting with us and um, telling us about your story and your book. Uh, okay. Well, we'd like, you know, I'd like to invite anybody in the county to come over and take a look at our terminal building and look at our facility, and I'll be happy to show them we have a whole bunch of uh, regalia in a, in a cabinet that I've captured from uh, things from Mao Zedong in China and, 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 and Russia and all over the world. And um, we'd be happy to entertain you and show you what what we're doing and why we're doing it. So please don't be afraid to stop by. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Howie. Um, you'll see this. Um, I'll send you guys a copy of this when we have the video done. Sure. And thank you. You you did a wonderful job, and <coughs> I appreciate it. All right. Well, hopefully we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.